Okay, so um, yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's really great. Uh, I, look, I look forward to seeing all the talks and seeing all of you. So this talk is going to be about uh, my personal trajectory, which happens to be a quantum one. And I'll share a little bit of wisdom I picked up along the way at the end. So my academic career began in the year 2000 when I started my undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Queensland. And I didn't really have any plans to become an academic, but I liked physics at school and it seemed like a reasonable thing to do at university. And even though I didn't have any clear plans about what I was going to do, I was really lucky because I really liked people and I really liked doing stuff. And so I was always talking to anyone who would talk to me. Uh, I was always asking them if they would just let me do stuff. And so this meant that I got involved in research really early on. Um, somehow I managed to convince a team of mechanical engineers to let me tag along to, a, uh, to launch a rocket in the middle of the Australian desert. Uh, this rocket was carrying an air breathing engine. Um, and then after that, uh, I, uh, when I came back to the physics department, I started uh, working on various other projects. Uh, so the first summer I worked on a project in quantum optics. This led to my first publication and a poster presentation at a conference. So I thought this was standard. So then the next summer when I worked on super selection rules for charge, I was disappointed to find out that not all research led to publications and conference travel. Uh, but I still liked it and wanted to do more. And uh, somehow I managed to get out of doing various pieces of coursework as well uh, by asking professors to let me do research in their groups instead. And actually, um, one of these proje projects led to my highest cited paper to date, which I think is cool. And so all this research meant that I got heavily involved in the life of the phys physics department. Uh, I also became the treasurer of the physics club and I got to know a lot of people. Uh, I had so much fun at the University of Queensland, I decided to stay there for my PhD in quantum optics. And I was really lucky to be part of the Center for Quantum Computing Technology. So there was a lot of funding available to go to uh, different conferences. I uh, also got to spend three months uh, working with an experimental group in Germany. Uh, that's where I developed my love for parametric down conversion, which is something that I still work on till this day. And, uh, you know, as I was writing my thesis, I didn't really have time to think about what I would do afterwards. But as it turned out, um, two weeks before submission, my, uh, my university was hosting this conference, QCMC, which is one of the biggest conferences in quantum computing. And so I essentially just spent the entire week uh, running around telling anyone who would listen that I was about to submit my thesis and I needed a job. And... Somehow this turned out to be a very effective strategy because by the end of the week, I had three postdoc offers and two of them would have been uh, continuing to do quantum optics. But the third one was in a new field called quantum biology, which I thought sounded really interesting. So I decided to take on this challenge and try my hands at quantum biology and I flew to Toronto. So uh, Toronto was great. Um, I worked really closely with people from different fields, uh, spectroscopists, chemists, biologists. Um, the research was really interdisciplinary and really fascinating. And as always, um, I made an effort to go to as many conferences and funding meetings as possible. Um, of course, because the science is interesting, uh, but I really enjoyed meeting people and um, seeing old friends who by now, uh, you know, everyone was spread out around the world. So it was really cool to, to see them at conferences. And then, uh, so I happened, you know, around two and a half years into the postdoc, I happened to be at this conference in, in Alaska. And while I was at this conference, I received uh, an email from my boss saying, uh, sorry, but our funding is not going to be continued and you, know, you pretty much don't have a job anymore. So this was um, a little bit scary and I briefly panicked. But um, then I remembered how it worked out last time that I needed a job. So. I just spent you know, the entire week running around the conference telling anyone who would listen that I needed a job. And uh, it worked again uh, because it turned out that uh, one of the people at the conference, uh, they just resigned from a position as PSI fellow at the Perimeter Institute. And uh, they still haven't found anyone to replace her. So she recommended me to the academic director at the time and I interviewed the next week and two weeks later, I found myself in Waterloo, starting the next chapter of my career as a uh, side fellow. So um, 
A large part of my role as Sci Fellow is related to the Sci program. Uh, this is our intense one year master's physics boot camp. And uh, in this program, I, I lecture um, as well as I assist various visiting lecturers. Uh, I develop various other programs and I'm heavily involved in mentorship. And uh, I'm also an adjunct associate professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so this lets me apply for government funding, which is great because then I can use that to fund my research group in quantum optics. And I also spend a lot of time interacting with, uh, with researchers at the Institute for Quantum Computing. So given all of this, you might be wondering right now, why is someone who is a lecturer and researcher in academia, why are they attending um, an event focused on industry? So I guess I'll tell you. So I, I started um, to get in, interested in industry about three years ago. Um, so at the time in the academic department at Perimeter, we were becoming increasingly aware of how weird it is that we spend all of our time training students to become academics when only a small fraction of them would remain in academia. Um, yet somehow everyone just pretended like as if academia was the only way to go. So um, we decided to track down people who had been trained in physics, uh, but had gone on to do other amazing things and to bring them back and to talk to our students and our postdocs. And this was the start of career trajectories. So uh, we organized a one day conference with talks and, and panels and a networking lunch. And we had almost 200 people attend and it was you know, a huge success. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we recorded many of the talks and panels. So if you're interested in watching any of the videos, which I highly recommend, uh, you can just go to YouTube and search for career trajectories and it should be one of the top hits. Um, the following year, we uh, launched a website to put all the resources we had collected in one place. And uh, we also had another one day conference, um, this time Crystal Bailey, who's the head of career programs at the American Physical Society. She came and spoke about what physicists do after graduating. Um, we also had more people who were um, trained as physicists, but went on to do uh, other things, uh, come back and give panel presentations. And uh, we had planned an event for this year, but you know, as with many things, unfortunately it was canceled due to COVID. Um, but right now we're working on a modified version online um, and I think we'll get some great ideas from this summit. I'm really loving this platform and um, maybe we'll think about using it uh, for, the, for the trajectories event. Okay, so, so over the last three years, um, I've been interacting with a lot of people whose trajectories took them from academia to other very cool places such as industry. And uh, while I encourage you to look at the videos of the panels yourselves, um, I thought I would take the opportunity to summarize what I think is the biggest takeaway message that I learned from all of these interactions. And I, I think this takeaway message is that you shouldn't underestimate the importance of meeting new people and developing uh, meaningful relationships. So meeting new people leads to new opportunities. Um, and this is a message that I would echo based on my experiences as well. Um, remember the story I told about how I needed to find a job quickly? In both cases, I did it by you know, introducing myself to as many people as possible. Although um, it's true that you know, talking to people isn't enough. Like if the only thing I had done was spent you know, one week talking to people, I wouldn't have gotten very far. Um, but what I also needed to do was to demonstrate my confidence in the relevant area where I was looking for opportunities. And so I was able to do that because I had already a lot of research experience. But the other thing that you need to do is, um, uh, well, you need to know that, you know, the people that you meet um, aren't they're not going to just like read all of your papers uh, at the point in time that, you know, you introduce yourself to them. So it's also important uh, for you to have people who know you and your work to be able to vouch for you. And luckily, I, I also had this because um, you know I had taken the time to develop meaningful relationships in my department as well as you know the broader community. And on top of that, you know, like all of the opportunities I had to demonstrate my confidence, I wouldn't wouldn't have had them in the first place if I didn't you know, make the effort to to meet people and you know ask them to let me join their groups and so on. And so. You know, almost every opportunity I've had in my life, including the opportunity to, you know, talk at this great workshop, um, it can be traced back to some, you know, strange trajectory where I met person A who introduced me to person B who suggested me for opportunity C. 
And um, so all of these things that I'm talking about here, they're kind of interconnected and they amplify each other. And so I, I like to think about it um, kind of like an equation. And what's important is this, this multiplication sign in the equation. Uh, so I think that you know, opportunities uh, can be uh, <laughs> quantified by uh, the number of new people that you need multiplied by you know, how much you demonstrate your confidence. And, you know, you could just focus on one of them. You could just focus on meeting new people or just focus on being really good at what you do. Uh, but to do well at that, you're going to have to work really, really, really hard on one of them in order to you know, make up for the fact that you're lacking in the other. And you only have finite time and energy. So I think you'll be more effective if you distribute these resources wisely. Um, okay, so another thing I'd like to stress is that you should seek variety in um, the people you build relationships with. So mentors are really important uh, because they give you insights into, into parts of the world that you don't have access to yet, and their experience is invaluable. Uh, but you shouldn't underestimate the um, value of developing close relationships with your peers because um, these people are not only uh, you know, going to be your friends who share your experiences, but in a decade, um, you know, some or many of them are going to be in influential positions. They might, you know, be the founder of a startup or they might be a professor and it's going to help for you to have them as your friends. And uh, you shouldn't underestimate uh, the many returns that you get from being a mentor to those with less experience than you. Um, I personally have learned a lot from my mentees and I've been given opportunities um, you know, by them that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Okay, so I'm almost at the end and, you know, Maybe at this point you're thinking, okay, well, that's great, but, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so how am I supposed to meet new people, let alone build meaningful relationships with them? Um, or you might be thinking, I live, you know, in an area that doesn't have many opportunities in the areas that I'm interested in. Um, so to tell you the truth, I've actually met more amazing people in the last, um, you know, uh, three months by LinkedIn and Zoom than I have in the last three years. So I just want to quickly tell you how to do this. Um, so, okay, you need to prioritize quality over quantity, and you certainly should not just like go and click connect on every LinkedIn profile that you see, and don't send hundreds of 10 paragraph impersonal emails to people. Um, what you should do is focus on a few people that you think you would like to get to know, do a little bit of research on them, then email them or send a personalized LinkedIn request, you know, saying how they made an impact on you and who you are and how you think they can help you. Um, and then if they respond warmly, you can ask them for, you know, a 15 minute Zoom chat or some advice or, you know, ask them if they can suggest anyone else to talk to. And, um, yeah, the last thing you should do is, you know, once you've established this relationship, just check in with them every few months because, you know, by now, if they've given you this time, they uh, started to care about you and they would love to know if they helped. And the cool thing is that this works with, um, you know, people in other countries, but as well as, you know, people in the department or company and community. So I'm out of time and I will end by saying thank you. Um, and I hope I will see you at the cocktail hour. <laughs>